Hey everyone, uh, welcome to my commute. This is Sleepy Reader. Uh, this is one of my vlog, countdown vlog vlogs. I, um, I commute every day and uh, usually what I do is listen to podcasts. Uh, podcasts about comics usually, sometimes about technology. Uh, the podcasts about comics keep me happy. If I listen to the news and think about how disappointed I am in, uh, in President Obama, then uh, it'll be a lot less of a happy commute, I'll tell you. So, um, one of the things that I seem to notice when I listen to podcasts where they interview artists and writers, <clears throat> excuse me, is how... Uh, no, <laughs> I'm being distracted by myself, um, is how they, um, is, is the collaboration between artists and writers, how they work together, who does what, and all of that. Um, like I particularly noticed when I listened to an interview with, uh, Scott Snyder by by Kevin Smith on Fat Man on Batman. Uh, when he started, when he did his first Batman assignment on Detective Comics, he asked if he could um, change the regular artist and um, who he felt had too much of a sort of bland, normal comic book style and go with an artist that he already knew. Um, and that's how he ended up working with Jock and Frank Avilla um, on his uh, on his first Batman work. And then there was also a lot of talk about the back and forth he had and the struggles he had at first to work well with um, with uh, uh, Greg Capullo and how they worked that out and um, and developed a really good working relationship. And so this is going to be a very roundabout discussion, which is, I guess, why I thought it would be good to, to do while I'm driving. But, um, and as I was thinking about the relationships between artists and writers, between artists and inkers and colorists and all of that, you know, it's kind of like how I found out over time that a lot of the members of my favorite rock and roll bands didn't get along with each other. To find out that uh, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee were not great friends. Um, to find out that uh, Joe Sinet and Jack Kirby never met until like years and years after all their great collaborations. Uh, you know, Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko did not see eye to eye and the list goes on. <laughs> uh, I found out recently that, um, that Gil Kane hated most of his inkers. But the fact is, maybe from the earliest comics I read were all Marvel, in which Stan Lee or who, whomever was the editorial guiding hand there, I believe Stan Lee, uh, worked hard to create the sense of a team bringing you your comics. Uh, a team who uh, spent a lot of time together and joked and had fun together, and I believe that there was some of that within the Marvel bullpen, but, but the most, most of the creators were freelancers and were not hanging around the Marvel bullpen. But anyway, be that as, as it may, that kind of underlined for me from an early period that um, how collaborative comics were, that you were watching the work of two, three, four, five, six people working together, coming together, their talents kind of melding. And I think that is very true of comics, whether or not the creators get along with each other or even know each other personally, um, <clears throat> that there's a kind of magic that often will work because of people collaborating. Uh, I have, 
you know, at times brainstormed ideas with friends or fellow writers at times. And often we come up with much better ideas after the brainstorming. And I would uh, wish in my little writing career that I had, had done that more often. However, the few times I did it, there were always arguments after the fact about who came up with what idea and that sort of thing, whose idea it was. Um, I was even in on the brainstorming of the naming of a magazine, and now, now both, both of us feel we're the ones that came up with the name of the magazine. But anyhow, um, getting too far off topic, there, there's something cool about that, and about a, uh, more than a year ago, when I was first starting up on YouTube, I did a video called Writers versus Artists, or Artists versus Writers, I think. I was playing off of AVX. But it was about how the, it was responding to an article about how the pendulum had swung towards writers. Writers get way more of the credit than artists these days. And that, um, that example I gave earlier about Scott Snyder um, asking for particular artists, I think goes to the point of writers have become kind of, they have become kind of the, it, it appears from what I read and see, they've become kind of the, um, the creative entrepreneurs, the ones who kind of steer the ship a little bit. And so a smart artist, a smart writer, picks artists who are going to make him look good. Um, and I don't mean just to look, look good, like the art will look good, but who can do really good storytelling and, and, and make and add a lot of extra value. So that part of why we think they are great writers, even though they are probably very good or great writers, is actually comes from the work of the artists that they, that they hand pick to work with. And that, uh, so you get this better product in the um, in the work of writers who really know how to pick artists and or get the most out of artists and there was a there was a podcast I forget what it's called but I'll I'll find out and I'll put it in the notes below um, which is done by Brandon St. Clair and um, Amy Reader who are collaborating on a on an image comic book they also did a Kickstarter for etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and they were discussing on this episode that I listened to the relationship between writers and artists and uh, Brandon St. Clair who'd been an editor previously said that unless you were one of the people working on a book you even if you're like a professional in the industry or an editor you probably can't really tell exactly how much of the work you know, the quality of the work and what you see, the elements of the, of the work came from the writer or the artist or the colorist. And um, the gist of their talk was that if you're an artist, you should do more of your own writing, that there's no, um, that it's a win-win situation for you if your, um, if your art appears, I mean, if, if you've done the writing also and the art. Because um, then you get all the credit for yourself um, of the good stuff. And I was kind of pondering that, and, and I really love the idea of the writer-artist, to tell you the truth. Uh, there's Will Eisner from the really early days, who seems like, to me, to have produced some of the greatest work ever in comics. Um, Jack Kirby did some really great work as a writer-artist, although there was also kind of a clunky aspect to it. And uh, Frank Miller, who to me was kind of a seminal, seminal figure in transforming comic books, was a writer-artist. And although he has done work as just a writer, I think there's something kind of crucial to his storytelling chops that it is a mix of writing and art. But it doesn't feel like the very best comic books late, you know, overall have come from writer-artists, that, um, that some writer-artists do a decent job, and I'm thinking of, like, uh, 
friends it's Manipool and um, and J.H. Uh, Williams the third and both of those people use co-writers but they still don't they still don't wow you as much as some of the writers do who with that aren't artists and uh, so maybe it only comes along every now and then that there's a an artist who has the full chops of a writer. Like part of what I'm thinking of is uh, it seems to me that the good writers kind of there's layers to what they do, and um, and that often when the artist does the writing, some of those layers fall away. Um, a writer often has. A good writer often has a scene that that uh, accomplishes many things at once. For instance, you can see that all the time with uh, with uh, Brian K. Vaughan's scenes in Saga, and um, you can see that kind of thing all the time. I mean, to an immense degree with uh, Alan Moore, of course. Um, but you look at something like The Flash. And it's good writing. There are writers who don't write as well as Francis Manipool and uh, Bucoletto do together. Um, but they also don't hit the top tier. There's something a little flatter. And, and, and that's probably why they stretch their stories out really long, because they don't manage to incorporate the kind of layers of material into each scene, etc. Um, I'm grasping here a bit. <laughs> But uh, another, um, but then there was, you know, I believe that uh, there were two Batman artists who were doing their own writing, David Finch and Tony Daniel, and I only tried those just the very slightest bit, and they just obviously did not develop uh, rich stories, and, um, and now they aren't writing those books, and they aren't writing in general. For the moment. <clears throat> Another great writer artist was Jim Starlin. And he's a decent writer, but actually I think his stuff is much better when he writes and draws it. Um, and for me, his peak work was quite a long time ago, but, but I haven't kept up with all of his work. He does less art now. Um, Walt Simonson, the same way, I think. Uh, and I don't, yeah, Walt Simonson's a good writer. I don't know if he's the greatest writer in the world. You know, so I'm looking at peak material, you know. So I feel that, uh, that Amy Reader and Brandon St. Clair, even though they had some good points, and there must be a lot, a lot more that goes on in the collaboration than, than we'll ever know, that I have to disagree with them that it's a good idea that writers, that artists do more and more of the writing because it, I just haven't seen enough examples of that. There has to be uh, an unusual case. Although then in another podcast that I was listening to, they were talking about how a lot of writers used to be writer artists. Apparently uh, Ed Brubaker wrote and drew his own kind of indie comics. And, of course, Brian Michael D Bendis early on drew his own comics. But I, just looking at the evidence, it seems like uh, they may have been people who loved comics and had a visual sense and so did their best with art, but they still weren't, like, superior artists. Um, and when they focused on just writing and thinking about what the artist does while writing, that they've produced uh, superior work. And I guess even Alan Moore, very early in his career, and uh, Grant Morrison, both also drew. So um, perhaps often the good writers do have some artistic ability and uh, a lot of a visual sense. So um, I still, you know, way back in that artist versus writers, I came down on the side of, the, to me, in that if you were to divide it up, that 55% of what makes a comic book good to me is the artist and 45% is the, 
writer. Yeah, I didn't really, I don't really want to put it in such exact terms, but in a rough sense, I, I think the, the artist has a little more importance to me than the writer, even though in my own life, I'm a bit of a writer. Um, and if you listen to interviews with writers, when they talk about uh, comics they loved as a kid, they talk about the artist. Um, you know, they talk about Neil Adams, and they talk about Jack Kirby, and they talk about Steve Ditko. That uh, that we can recognize, particularly in those old comics, that the quality of the whole, not just the beauty of the art, but the whole storytelling went up and uh, improved with the right artist. I'm hoping in the future that, you know, like, but particularly the manipole on the flash comes really close like they just need to be kicked up a level um, and that that you get something really special when the art and the writing are so deeply um, entwined enmeshed part of each other so I keep hoping that um, that manipole and Bucoletto or manipole and whoever he works with um, just kind of move up to the next level. Sometimes I've found in my own writing that, that moving up to the next level, a big part of that is in the rewriting. That, um, But every writer works differently. But, but a lot of times, writers who do, you know, an extra number of drafts that may not seem necessary. You might already have what seems like a very good draft. But they do a few extra drafts they add in something extra into the mix that suddenly brings everything up to a higher level. Um, you know, I know that Scott Snyder does lots of drafts from having her talk, and I imagine a lot of the other best writers are the kind of writers who do lots of drafts. And an artist may not be thinking that way because he hasn't uh, put all his eggs, so to speak, into the basket of writing. Anyway, I'll talk to you all later. Thanks for coming along on this little drive with me.